All right, so welcome to the module six lecture video. Uh, first thing I wanna say is, um, so if you look at the assigned reading for this week, uh, with regards to chapter 26, I assigned you pages 1038 to 1054. Uh, that's basically the beginning of chapter 26. Um, so I'd, if you haven't read that, I'd recommend you read that first because that gives you kind of good background for what I'm gonna talk about in this lecture. Um, so yeah, again, if you haven't read that, uh, pages 1038 to 1054 as of yet. Um, yeah, I'd recommend you go go and read that part. Shouldn't take too long. Uh, and then um, and then click uh, click the video back on. Okay, so we're gonna start by talking about the end of the American economy's golden age. So if you recall, the golden age of the American economy um, was basically from you know right after World War II ended. So, you know, roughly 1950 to about 1973, and it was characterized by um, unprecedented economic expansion. Uh, but more than anything else, um, this was prosperity that was broadly shared. Uh, wage growth, uh, re, you know, happened to an unprecedented degree. We saw an unprecedented uh, degree of wage growth among you know lower income working class and and uh, middle income Americans, especially uh, people that worked in manufacturing. So that comes to a, cre a screeching halt uh, in many ways in the 1970s. Um, uh, and yeah, that's the end of the economy's golden age. Uh, and yeah, let's let's get into it here. So uh, the focus question is, in what ways did the opportunities of most Americans diminish in the 1970s? Again, the question is, in what ways did the opportunities of most Americans diminish in the 1970s? So there we go. Okay, so we're going to talk about the economic woes beginning basically in 1973, uh, the early early to mid 1970s, and uh, this has to do with the decline of manufacturing and stagflation uh, is important here as well. So I'll get to that in a couple of minutes. So in the 1970s, here we go. Um, yeah, so in the 1970s, uh, post-war economic expansion. Uh, and consumer prosperity ended, as I mentioned a second ago. Um, and uh, this saw, uh, uh, with with those things ending, we saw the beginning of slow growth, a period of, of slow growth, especially compared to uh, what happened before and the uh, alleged golden age of the American economy, uh, and also a period of high inflation. And slow growth um, and high inflation happening simultaneously, and that's basically what stagflation refers to. Uh, that's that's especially you know troubling. So what uh, the question is first of all, what caused the end of the economy's golden age? So certainly there's um, a number of different factors here. So uh, yeah, the end of capitalism's uh, American capitalism's golden age was caused by you know many factors. I think one. Uh, one was undoubtedly uh, that, so, you know, basically a booming economy uh, driven in part by a military industrial complex um, uh, with a booming economy driven in part by a military industrial complex, um, various presidential administrations um, had, hadn't had fully realized how the Cold War might have less positive economic consequences. So um, certainly the Cold War had many uh uh, positive economic consequences that I think I, I talked about in the last video and you guys have read about. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, defense, uh, the buildup of, of defense within the context of the Cold War um, uh, gave a lot of people a lot of good jobs and contributed to economic growth and rising stock prices and widespread prosperity um, uh, to a certain extent. But there were negative uh, uh, economic um, consequences to this military industrial complex. So if you think about it, so to check the Soviets, the United States had to promote um, or had promoted the economic um, reconstruction of um, uh, countries like Germany and also Japan. And the United States had also supported new man manufacturing in places um, such as South Korea and Taiwan. So the U.S. government encouraged American companies uh, as well to invest overseas and didn't necessarily complain when allies protected their um, own industries while seeking unrestricted access to U.S. markets. So the U.S. basically built up all of these other, helped build up all of these other countries and their economic uh, help economically reconstruct these countries and build up their manufacturing, you know, bases of manufacturing. Um, 
and uh, they encourage American companies to invest overseas as well. Um, uh, like, like I just mentioned, um, and, uh, didn't necessarily mind when, uh, they, they put in place, you know, protectionist policies, protecting their nascent, uh, industries again, in places like Taiwan and Japan and, and Germany and et cetera. Right. Um, uh, steel imports, um, uh, but that, this had, this had negative consequences, right. Uh, for example, steel, uh, steel imports, um, devastated the American steel industry. Right. So basically this leads to, um, industries being built up in these other countries that uh, begin importing various consumer goods um, and, and items uh, that um, uh, are it, that it's hard for America's domestic industry to compete with, for example, America's domestic steel industry. Um, so we'll talk more about that. Another factor in the end of the economy's golden age, I think, was uh, the strong dollar. Uh, so it's kind of a long story, but basically, so the strong American, the strength of the American dollar, meaning the high value vis-a-vis -vis other currencies of the American uh, dollar, um, <clears throat> uh, and the American dollar was initially tied to gold, and this was based on the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement. Um, but the strong dollar, despite its, you know, maybe uh, positive aspects uh, to that, you don't want a, a super, super weak um, currency. But there were negatives to the str increasingly strong dollar of the early 1970s, uh, high value of the U.S. dollar. Um, and one of those is that uh, it hurt American exporters. So it made, made exporters have a harder time selling their goods overseas, right? In 1971, for the first time in the 20th century, that the United States, uh, indeed, had a trade deficit, meaning the United States imported more goods than it exported. Um, and, you know, by 1980, almost all goods produced in the United States were competing with foreign made products. And the number of manufacturing workers uh, had declined um, from about 38% in 1960 to about 28% in, um, uh, in 1980. So again, it went from uh, uh, 38% in 1960, 38% of all workers were in manufacturing to uh, about 10% less uh, uh, percentage of manufacturing uh, workers in, in 1980. Um, in a similar uh, development, um, in 1971, Nixon announced a uh, departure with regards to economic policy and currency policy specifically. So Nixon um, decided to take the United States off the gold standard in 1971, uh, 1971 uh, effectively ending the Bretton Woods Agreement that fixed the value of the dollar uh, and uh, uh, American currency in gold. So initially, American currency was tied to gold, uh, but um, after ending um, this uh, this this situation, uh, this agreement, um, uh, world currencies uh, floated in relation to one another, and their worth determined uh, was uh, was determined, uh, and the value of the U.S. dollar, for example, was determined not by treaty but by international currency markets. Um, and so Nixon's rationale for this was that uh, this would help promote U.S. exports, right? Um, uh, but the end of fixed currency rates had uh, functioned to, um, uh, to have many negative effects, unfortunately. Um, these destabilized. Uh, so again, the... Uh, uh, the end of fixed currency rates and the floating of U.S. currency uh, and the essentially detaching uh, the dollar uh, U.S. currency from the gold standard functioned to, to increasingly destabilize the world economy. Um, Nixon uh, also froze wages and prices for 90 days to attempt to stabilize the economy. Uh, and, you know, this worked for a short period of time or seemed to work. Um, but Nixon's policies, um, so me back up. Um, although Nixon's policies briefly stopped inflation and uh, reduced imports, which uh, which both of those things were were good um, to an extent, um, uh, geopolitical events you know interceded and reversed the progress that Nixon had made with his you know uh, changes to U.S. currency and the freezing of wages and uh, the freezing of, uh, of prices for ninety days. And specifically, what happened was uh, in the mid. Uh, 
uh, events erupted in the Middle East, I guess we could say. So a war between Israel and its neighbors, um, Egypt and Syria, led mid uh, Middle Eastern governments to hike the price of oil and suspend oil exports to the United States for several months. And of course, I'm referring here to the uh, Arab oil embargo. So uh, OPEC, uh, which stands for the oil... Um, uh, now I'm drawing a blank for some reason. Uh, the Organization, sorry, of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, right? Um, and not all of these countries were in the Middle East, but most of them are located roughly in, in Southwest Asia and the Middle East. And um, so, yeah, basically these, these you know, uh, geopolitics um, led to uh, a severe... Um, uh, shortage uh, or basically hike in the price of oil uh, and a suspension of oil exports to the United States from uh, from OPEC, which uh, produced a an, an, uh, significant energy shock in the United States, right? So the uh, Arab oil embargo, um, the oil embargo uh, basically produced long lines of cars at American gas stations. And these gas stations either, you know, in some cases ran out of fuel. Uh, in other cases, um, the supply of fuel was just limited um, uh, and therefore for these ga uh, gas stations typically limited how much a customer could could buy on one trip to the gas station. Uh, and uh, by this point as well, the United States imported one third of its oil. Um, so, you know, these events uh, really highlighted the amount of um, uh, the, you know, share of U.S. oil uh, consumption uh, that was uh, was being imported, right? That came from imported oil, um, and so Congress immediately responded. Uh, and uh, you know, basically, these oil shocks, these energy shocks, um, produce a number of different effects, had a number of different consequences, and different legislation ch and changes and uh, and movements and that kind of thing. So one thing that happened was that Congress lowered uh, the speed limit. Actually, so I believe um, <clears throat> they lowered the speed limit on U.S. highways to 55 miles an hour. The idea being, I guess, that. Uh, you know, uh, the slower you go, the more fuel efficient your your car is. So it's intended to increase fuel efficiency. I believe um, uh, regulations on the maximum uh, speed uh, a car, um, the maximum capacity uh, for speed uh, for miles per hour a car could be um, made at. Uh, I don't know that I'm explaining that the best that I possibly could, but uh, so I believe that changed during this era of the 1970s and 1980s as well. Um, I remember I, uh, at one point I had a car that was made um, uh, in the 1980s. Uh, I think it was 1984. And I think it, um, it maxed out, I think at like 85 or 90 miles an hour, um, which is interesting. And I, I believe that was a result of these changes and regulations. And again, the idea was to cr increase um, fuel economy, fuel efficiency, right? Um, so what were the broader consequences of the oil embargo and the energy crisis? Well, um, this crisis served to focus public att attention on um, domestic um, domestic energy uh, sources like oil, coal, and natural gas. Oil exploration, um, uh, not surprisingly, increased in the American West beginning in, in the mid 1970s. Uh, and in Alaska, pipe, uh, in Alaska, pipelines opened to facilitate shipment to the rest of the country. Uh, also, coal production in Wyoming uh, boomed uh, during this time. And the high oil prices set by OPEC, um, uh, you know, really functioned to benefit these Western energy uh, companies, right, by stimulating, in many ways, stimulating, um, you know, domestic energy production from coal, from oil, from natural gas, Etc. Let me talk about stagflation. So, <clears throat> uh, rising oil prices affected the global economy and contributed to the combination of stagnant economic growth and high uninflation, uh, and uninflation known as stagflation. So between 1973 and 1981, the inflation rate in developed nations was 10% per year. Um, well, economic growth at the same time, again, 1973 to 1981, was 2.4% per, uh, 2 per year. Um, and this economic growth of 2.4% per year was a sharp deterioration from what it had been in the 1970s. So basically, it's this odd, you know, terrible, in many ways, combination of low economic growth, uh, <clears throat> you know, a stagnant uh, economy, uh, 
uh, combined with high inflation, uh, increasing prices, right? Um, and economists even came up with the so-called misery index, the misery index, right? And this was the sum of unemployment and inflation rates. So if you look at the misery index, again, the sum of the unemployment rate and the inflation rate. Um, so in 1970, the misery index was 10.8. By comparison, in 1980, the misery index was 22. That gives you an idea of the increasing prevalence um, of stagflation. In, in the American economy. Americans responded to rising oil prices by, not surprisingly, buying more fuel efficient cars. Um, many of these cars were increased, especially as we get into the 1980s, uh, but even beginning in the late 1970s were produced in places like Japan. They were produced overseas. Uh, and this hurt the domestic auto industry, um, which I'll, I'll talk more about uh, shortly here. Okay, so... Yeah, this is a, a picture of, you know, lines that, uh, you know, this represents the gas the gas shortage, energy, energy shock, energy crisis, basically. Okay, let's talk about labor and the end of the golden era. So I'm going to talk about the beleaguered social compact and uh, organized labor being increasingly on the defensive uh, during during this time. So let's talk about the erosion of the social compact. So the economic crisis helped uh, of of um, big, that had begun in 1973 helped erode the post war social compact. So facing lower profits and more global competitions uh, competition. Um, cor corporations um, uh, changed their policies, changed how they did business. So one thing they did was eliminate higher paying manufacturing jobs through automation. Uh, they also moved many jobs overseas or to more low wage parts of the country in the South and the West. We'll talk more about that. So for example, older areas, um, uh, older industrial areas, I should say, like Detroit and Chicago were devastated. Well, smaller industrial cities um, and areas were, in some cases, even worse off, right? Suffered even more. Uh, and they saw their tax bases um, disappear. And as a result, their public services disappeared. Um, Deindustrialization left, um, you know, a landscape of abandoned buildings, um, uh, and massive depopulation, people moving to other parts of the country. So again, abandoned, you know, factories and office buildings and um, uh, single family homes with uh, nobody in there for five or 10 years. Uh, the poverty rate in many of these places reached 20%. Uh, increasingly, jobs, investment, and population were moving, as I mentioned a second ago, to non-union low-wage states of the Sun Belt, uh, referring basically to the South and West. Uh, in this region, um, uh, this, this term, the Sun Belt, came is a term that came to uh, came into widespread use during this time to describe the growing economic and political influence uh, of the South and West, which was increasingly a conservative bastion, um, uh, and the conservative politics that uh, that really. Uh, rises in in the late 20th century in many ways comes out of the 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 uh, um, uh, the economic development and the uh, and people moving uh, the economic development happening in the south and west and the types of people that moved to the south and west and the environment they encountered <clears throat> and their lived experience in the south and west. Um, Sunbelt cities produced a different uh, model of development and spatial growth in the older urban centers of the North and Midwest. So businesses and new housing developments often sprang up along highways in in uh, in places like uh, you know Phoenix and Los Angeles and Houston and and Atlanta, right? And that was in contrast to the way cities like Boston and and New York and and Detroit and et cetera had been built. And some manufacturing centers um, uh, should should be mentioned that political and economic leaders uh, actually welcomed uh, change to a certain extent. So, for example, in New, uh, New York constructed the World Trade Center in 1977, and this was meant to symbolize um, the sh uh, uh, economic shift, right? Uh, and to make way, however, to make way for the Twin Towers, the city uh, displayed hundreds of displays, excuse me, hundreds of small businesses, uh, causing, of course, the loss of thousands of manufacturing jobs, right? So even in uh, an eastern urban area like New York City, like Manhattan, um, uh, we see the shift to a new economy, 
uh, and to an increasingly globalized economy, globalization, uh, financial, financialization, the financialization of the American economy, and a loss of, of manufacturing, right? And that was symbolized by the twin towers of the World Trade Center, of course, until uh, 9-11, right? Uh, knock the, the Twin Towers down. Uh, organized labor, uh, as I mentioned a second ago, increasingly found itself on the defensive during this era. Um, so the declining power of unions and the continuing economic shift from manufacturing, uh, the U.S. being a, being a manufacturing-based economy, to a service-based economy uh, adversely affected many ordinary Americans. So for example, uh, medium income uh, had doubled between 1953 and 1973, but by contrast, from 1973 to 1993, medium uh, income, uh, family income didn't rise at all. So stagnating income, stagnating wages uh, ushered in this era of a service economy replacing a manufacturing economy. Okay, so we're gonna, let's talk about the, the, Ford, uh, the Ford administration and the Carter administration. So, by the way, this shows the misery index from 1970 to 1980. If you want to take a quick look at that. So we have a rising misery index from 1970 to 1980. That's a picture of the old World Trade Center. And this shows a decline in real average weekly wages from 1955 uh, well, it's showing 1955 to 1990, but we see, you know, it's it's a precipitous gain all the way up to, to about 1973. And from 1973 to 1990, um, you know, with the exception of a few upticks here and there, it's a pretty precipitous drop. We see a pretty precipitous drop. Uh, again, let's talk about the Ford and Carter, uh, Ford and Carter administrations and uh how they went about dealing with the economic crisis and the political fallout of the economic crisis. And, uh, okay, so what was the political fallout of the 1970s economic crisis is kind of the, the uh, question here. Well, so yeah, the economic crisis um, troubled the successors to the presidents that came after, deeply troubled the presidents that came after Richard Nixon, uh, not, not surprisingly. So Nixon resigned um, as a result of the Watergate scandal. And uh, actually before Nixon resigned, Vice President Agnew, who was involved in the scandal, uh, the Watergate scandal resigned. Uh, and so Nixon had to find a new vice president and that new vice president was Gerald Ford. Uh, from from Michigan, and Nixon ended up resigning, and that meant that Ford um, became president uh, when Nixon resigned in 1973, and he uh, named um, Nelson Rockefeller of New York as his vice president. And so uh, Ford in the presidency and Rockefeller in in the vice presidency uh, meant that for the first actually the first time in U.S. history, both uh, the presidency, the office of the presidency, and office of the vice presidency were occupied by by uh, people that no one had voted for. Um, so that uh, put them in a tough spot, suffice to say. Um, one of Ford's first acts was to pardon uh, pardon Richard Nixon, and um, uh, which prevented uh, Nixon from being prosecuted for obstruction of justice, and the public didn't respond well to this. This was deeply unpopular, although a lot of people would argue this was the right thing to do. Uh, I'll leave it to, to you to to uh, decide, but um, uh, this was deeply unpopular uh, with, with most Americans. And, and so this kind of decreased Ford's uh, already limited supply of political capital. Uh, Ford really, uh, in the short time he was president, had uh, very few significant accomplishments in terms of domestic policy. Uh, Ford and his economic advisor, uh, at, uh, who was Alan Greenspan, I think was his lead economic advisor, wanted Americans, um, you know, sought to to mitigate the economic crisis by having Amer uh, encouraging Americans to spend less and save more. Uh, in order to build money um, to invest in the American economy, right? Uh, they also called for tax cuts and less government economic regulation. Um, the Democratic majority in Congress, not surprisingly, didn't approve of these, uh, you know, pretty conservative economic uh, policies. Um, uh, and to fight inflation, Ford urged Americans to shop wisely, reduce spending, and to wear win buttons. And win stood for whip inflation now, win. Whip inflation now. Uh, 
And so we kind of promoted this this uh, acronym WIN, Whip Inflation Now, and uh, and he did succeed to a certain extent. And you know, as uh, inflation did did fall, um, and unemployment rose at the same time in 1975 um, to the highest level since the Great Depression. On the foreign policy front, Ford. Uh, let me talk about Ford's foreign policy. So Ford really continued Nixon's policy of detente. Uh, with the Soviet Union, so kind of a uh, a thawing, uh, a lessening of Cold War tensions, or at least some attempts um, to head in that direction. Uh, and so, for example, the United States signed an agreement with the Soviets in Helsinki, Finland, uh, under uh, the Ford administration, during the Ford administration, that recognized the permanence of the division of Europe um, between basically America, uh, United States aligned, you know, Western Europe and Soviet aligned Eastern Europe. The Helsinki Accords uh, inspire movements uh, for freedom in Eastern Europe's communist countries as well. And that would become important in terms of the, well, eventually fall of the Berlin Wall and end of the Cold War. Uh, but anyway, let's get to the presidential election of 1976. So in, in uh, the 1976 election, uh, Ford ran against Jimmy Carter, who was the, the Democratic presidential nominee. And Carter was a former governor of Georgia. He was virtually unknown outside of his state um, uh, at the time he launched his campaign for, uh, for the Democratic nomination. Um, and this he actually... Uh, this redounded to his benefit, and this started a trend um, that has only increased ever since of politicians, you know, uh, really emphasizing their outsider status, right? So they tend to de-emphasize the extent to which they've been in Washington, D.C., because Washington, D.C. is, you know, the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the federal bureaucracy are seen as unpopular <clears throat> or unpopular, generally speaking, with the American public. And so they tend to emphasize, you know, their experiences uh, on the local state level, governor, state legislatures, uh, or in, the, in private business, right? Um, so Carter, kind of started in many ways started this this trend right so he he realized that watergate in vietnam had produced a crisis in confidence in the federal government and as a result he turned uh his obscurity into an advantage and he ran for president as an outsider right making a virtue of the fact that he had actually never filled uh, held federal office um before before this that would have been seen as a, a negative he turned it in he spun it into a positive uh carter in many ways was a modern day progressive and by progressive i mean um early 20th century progressive he had many things in common with early 20th century progressives so he had a passion i would say for making government more efficient and that was a big that was one of the calling cards the modus operandi's of uh early 20th century progressives, right? Um, he also was interested in protecting the environment, another parallel with, um, or he, he prioritized environmental protection, efficiency, government efficiency. Uh, again, another parallel with, uh, with the progressives of the early 20th century. Uh, and he also sought to raise the moral tone of politics, right? Um, bring morality uh, into, uh, into, more explicitly in, into politics. Um, and again, I think there's par parallels between that and early 20th century progressives. However, unlike progressives, <laughs> um, he embraced the aspirations of Black Americans as well, um, and actually appointed a, in uh, an unprecedented number of Blacks to important positions during his his uh, four years in office. So let's talk about Carter and the Democratic Party. Um, and, and how they went about dealing with the economic crisis. So really Carter and the Democratic Party struggled just as Ford had to deal with the economic crisis. And in many ways, this proved to be Carter's undoing. Although his party controlled both houses of Congress, um, Carter often didn't agree with Democrats and in, in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. So Carter really viewed inflation rather than unemployment as the country's main economic problem. And to combat uh, inflation, he wanted to promote Cuts in spending, uh, and you know, cuts in spending on domestic programs. Uh, he hoped that increasing competition among private businesses would reduce prices uh, and therefore, you know, bring down inflation. Right. Um, and his administration, uh, as a result, enacted deregulation uh, in uh, 
the airline, uh, the airline industry and trucking industries and in, in certain other industries. Um, so deregulation was was a, uh, a path they, they went down to a large extent. Carter also cut taxes for wealthier Americans and repealed usury laws. Um, uh, however, inflation didn't decline. So if you're going to go in this just kind of conservative economic direction of deregulation and uh, really stimulating private, private business, um, then... Um, uh, at bare minimum, this should help with inflation, but it really didn't, right? Uh, didn't didn't really help with with inflation, so that was bad for for Carter and bad bad for the country. Carter also believed that expanded use of nuclear energy could help reduce dependence on on imported um, oil. Um, so Carter was initially a big advocate of nuclear energy, but kind of bad timing on that. With the nineteen um, what happened was the nineteen seventy nine in nineteen seventy nine uh, the nuclear industry suffered a near nearly fatal blow uh, when an accident at Three Mile Island. Uh, the the, the uh, Three Mile Island plan in Pennsylvania uh, released a large amount of radioactive steam into the atmosphere. The, the Three Mile Island mishap reinforced fears about the environmental hazards associated with nuclear energy and put a halt to the to uh, nuclear um, the nuclear in industry's expansion. Um, and you kind of put all this together, and it seemed to many Americans that Carter was presiding over national decline. Uh, and that definitely did not um, redound to his benefit. Yeah, so this is, and I think, uh, yeah, this is related to Ford's whip inflation now or win uh, program. This is uh, shows the pre the results of the presidential election of nineteen seventy nine. Uh, sorry, nineteen seventy six. And deregulation, I believe I put this on my syllabus. You might be wondering what the heck this is a picture of. So uh, this is how airlines uh, used to look from the inside. Pretty amazing, huh? So here's, uh, you might be wondering in what universe uh, an airline, you know, look at the, you know, spaciousness and what looks to be delicious food and fantastic service. Uh, anyone who's been on an airline, uh, I was going to say recently, but really in the last 40 or 50 years, uh, you know, has likely had uh, a very uh, different experience, right? So the deregulation of the airline industry produced lower fares, but also a drastic uh, decline, uh, decline in service. So before deregulation, um, which uh, this, this airline assuredly um, that's pictured here would have been before de deregulation uh, was instituted in, in the late 1970s. So before deregulation, um, prices were fixed and airlines as a result, uh, different airline companies sought to attract customers and compete with one another by providing good services in all classes. So the point was to, yeah, compete with each other, uh, each other with, you know, service uh, based on good service. However, um, uh, after deregulation, uh, Airlines compete with each other basically by providing low fares, right? And so the positive was that fares, uh, you know, uh, airlines became the province of kind of like everyone or a large swath of the population. Uh, and, you know, relative, we saw uh, it, it was a change to relatively low fares. But the negative, obviously, is that passengers are jammed in like sardines and have to pay for check bags and onboard meals and uh, other amenities. So it's kind of a a pick your poison kind of situation, I guess you could say. Okay, that's uh, uh, pictured here as Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, the site of the nuclear uh, disaster. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end video one there. Uh, we're gonna pick it up with video two and talk about uh, the roots of the rise of conservatism in the 1970s.